Uh, the title of my talk today is uh, The Hijacking of Religion by Politics and of Politics uh, by Religion. And I want to say uh, right from the start that this title is not my own. This title was given to me by the Women Explorer, the group here. And I must admit that initially when the title came to me, I was uncomfortable with the title. Uh, because the term hijacking connotes a crime. It connotes the stealing of something or the seizing of something for insidious purposes. And of course, in a 9-11 world, a post-9-11 world, a term that I tend to resist, even as I acknowledge the historical, cultural, and political significance and currency of that concept. Uh, hijacking has a very specific meaning that cannot be underestimated. One that actually helps to illuminate, perhaps ironically or unwittingly, precisely how interrelated and at times indistinguishable religion and politics are in our time. Indeed, 9-11 itself, the terrible events that happened that day, as well as the fundamentalism that inspired those events, and the exceptionalism, itself, in my opinion, a form of fundamentalism, that fueled the reaction to them, particularly the US reaction to them, offers powerful evidence of that linkage between religion and politics. Just a little bit more on this. Uh, Muslim terrorists who were responsible for 9-11 principally were motivated by a kind of religious fundamentalism. This was a kind of political act of political violence that was motivated by religious fundamentalism. And it was also in many ways, as we've seen and heard from folks who claim responsibility for this, that this act of terrorism was also in some ways a rejection of what the folks who were responsible for this perceived to be secular excesses in the United States, principally. That the Americans are infidels, and that is the word that often was used, particularly in the wake of 9-11, immediately after that. The World Trade Center, of course, and the Pentagon, which were the principal targets of the terrorist attacks on 9-11, were symbols of that infidelism, or that excess, the secular excess that was perceived. And then we had, in the immediate aftermath of the terrorist attacks on 9-11, President Bush giving three successive speeches over the course of the day, each one more sophisticated rhetorically than the other, uh, and each longer than the other, which ended in the evening of 9-11 with President George W. Bush explicitly engaging in a kind of Christian recoding of American nationalism as a way to frame the war on terror as an exercise in national security. And this led to, I think, a widespread belief in the culture, too widespread, according to someone like me, from my perspective, uh, that this was a sort of perceived attack by them on our way of life. And so the war on terror, and Bush's, in fact, Bush's, the Bush doctrine, was very much constructed around that sort of notion that there was a kind of world of us and them, that we were for freedom and they were for something else, that this was a threat to our way of life, and that if you weren't with us, you were against us. Bush uh, very famously, rhetorically, thought and spoke in binaries, binaries which may not seem to rise to the level of sophistication and nuance that some of us in academia would like to have seen, um, but nonetheless, rhetorically and politically, were incredibly powerful, and that shaped the nation's response to 9-11 and also the sort of prevailing ideology that drives our foreign policy still to this day, I would argue, alas. But then, of course, after 9-11, in the wake of all this, there were millions and millions of Muslims and Christians, both in the United States and throughout the world, who saw both of these fundamentalisms, a terrorism wrapped in Islam and an American exceptionalism wrapped in Christianity, as having gone way too far. And now that we're 10, 11, 12 years out of this terrible day, uh, having experienced this terrible decade of the first a decade of this century, many of us regret that. Uh, but in fact, if we think about it, too many of us were silent. As 9-11 illustrates, there is and should be genuine concern about the stealing or seizing of religion by politics and of politics by religion. And hijacking may very well be the appropriately hyperbolic way to characterize this concern or anxiety. Many Americans, myself included, value the ideas that one, we should all have the right to freely worship any god we want, or no god at all. And two, that a specific church should never guide the political affairs of this particular nation. These are foundational American ideals, articulated among other, and among other places, Thomas Jefferson's 1785 Act for Establishing 
Religious Freedom, a document that he valued uh, as much as the Declaration of Independence in his own uh, life. And the First Amendment of the Constitution, ratified, of course, in 1791, the first uh, article of the Bill of Rights. Put another way, for as long as the nation has been in existence, and even before then, frankly, we have tended to believe that democracy should not be and must not be ruled by divinity. And that has been a foundational claim and one that has driven much of our political culture. And that is why, aside from American flag lapel pens, which I think are fairly silly, uh, there is nothing that makes me bristle more uncomfortably than the rhetorical political trope, God bless America, whether it comes from the, the mouth of President George W. Bush or President Barack Hussein Obama. The discomfort that I have when I hear God bless America stems from my upbringing. I was raised in a social justice Catholic household, the only child of working class <coughs> parents and grandparents, where faith was largely a private matter not a public one, where the walk, what you do, was at least as important as the talk, what you said. My athletic director father, he's a basketball coach, he's my basketball coach and a high school athletic director, is never gets more animated when watching TV when he sees an athlete thanking God for a home run or a hit. <laughs> and he always screams, does that mean God like the hitter more than the pitcher? <laughs> My father and mother have never worn their religion on their sleeve, and neither, in fact, do I, although in, in weird sort of ways, I'm not a regular church goer anymore, my parents go every day and uh, every week. Uh, I actually wear my religion on my sleeve a little bit more than they do, uh, which is an odd thing. We can talk about why I do that later on. Uh, but they've never worn their religion on their sleeve, and they believe deeply that God has far more important things to worry about than whether the Yankees beat the Red Sox. Although I will admit, we often prayed for such things in my partisan New York household. Um, but as a recovering Catholic and a devout Yankees fan, I will admit that all of us indeed have our sins. <laughs> but more seriously, as attracted, my dog's name is Jeter, and I make no apologies. <laughs> And one of my Red Sox fans the other day saw my dog and said, your dog's getting kind of fat, just for you. Uh, anyway, more seriously, as attractive as these concepts and distinctions are to many of us, freedom of religion, separation of church and state, democracy versus divinity, private versus public, indeed the personal versus political, even the walk and the talk, do not work for everyone. And I'd like to argue today as an initial proposition that on a very practical level of lived experience in our common political culture, I would go so far as to say that they don't really work for anyone. As political subjects and historical agents, we are all moral creatures. And our politics, what we believe and how we act on those beliefs, individually and electorally, is deeply influenced by our morality and vice versa. In my own upbringing, I experienced this tension. Going to mass was a private ritual, participating in the rituals of our faith in church. But the public matter of living the kind of life that Jesus intended us to live, of loving our brothers and sisters, of feeding the hungry and housing the homeless, tending to those who were outcasts and misfits in society, clothing the naked, even confronting and perhaps even eradicating poverty a lesson from the Bible and Jesus' teachings that too many of us forget when we're talking about abortion and gay marriage and climate change. But these were political acts, living as Jesus taught us to live, and even political ones. It was an attempt in my parents' understanding of it to translate matters of faith into matters of fraternity. And so I should also say that my decision to leave the Catholic Church in my mid-20s, in the 1990s, was a decidedly political one. I came to this decision at the same time that I was coming out, having decided at that point in my life that identities of homosexuality and Catholicism were fully incompatible with one another. <laughs> After all, that was what my church and my priests had been teaching me from the pulpit, and also political lessons, for as long as I could remember. And I'll get back to the priests and to the nuns, the glorious nuns, later on <laughs> in my talk. But suffice it to say, when I talk about hijacking of religion by politics and of politics by religion, I know of what I speak because I am a gay American. So for the rest of my time today, I want to explore religion and politics not as enemies, 
but as twins. I want to explore the relationship between religion and politics, not as one of hijacking, as some egregious crime we should seek to punish or prevent, but as an essential and enduring conflict between two different versions of the world. I want to make the point that I think it's important for us from the outset here, and I'm going to be, you know, my, as always, my politics will be out there, as will my faith. Uh, but I want to make it clear that I want that I take all sides of these issues very seriously, increasingly so as I get older. I used to be much more strident politically and religiously than I am now. Um, but I take people who disagree with me very seriously, their values and their visions, as long as they have both of those things that are driving what they have to say. Perhaps it's my own religious background. Perhaps it's my working class background which has a lot of conservative elements in it, a lot of conservative people in my family. But I think more than anything, it's my teaching experience at a place that is so diverse, that has so many different kinds of people from so many different backgrounds and identities. And these students, in all of their diversity and all of their difference, have taught me profound lessons about empathy and about tolerance. Doesn't mean I always agree with them. Doesn't mean they always agree with me. But we can have those conversations, those debates, those battles, and those are family battles. It's hard to do this, very hard to do this, to assume good intentions in everyone, because not everyone, frankly, has good intentions. And believe me, I struggle with this, but I do believe, as old as, as the older I get, that these kinds of taking people seriously, despite their differences from your own, uh, is absolutely imperative to the health and future of any democratic, diverse culture. I want to say also that the experience of coming out, which my dear friend Darnell Moore, who spoke here at the Kennedy School a couple weeks ago, has reframed as inviting in. The idea of coming out and inviting in people who may be uncomfortable with you, who you are, who you love, how you love. But it's been the process, the slow journey, the profoundly transformational journey of changing hearts and minds in my own life and having my own heart and my own mind changed that especially among religious people, that has been something that taught me perhaps one of the most profound lessons that I've had. I feel less lonely now having engaged and walked that journey with people who were uncomfortable with me, who have learned to love me nonetheless. And it is my experience as a despised sexual minority that has taught me the profoundest lessons about the pitfalls and possibilities of empathy and love across lines of difference. Before proceeding today, I wanted to say that I don't have any of this figured out, <laughs> that I have strong beliefs and convictions and a very, very strong value system. I'm well known around here for that. But I do not pretend to have any of this figured out and have arrived at some kind of absolute truth. Each of us has our own truth, shaped as it is by our identities and experiences, our perceptions and our prejudices. But I offer these thoughts in the hopes that we can have a conversation, even a robust and contentious one about these matters, because these are matters that are essential to all of us, regardless of our creed or color, our party or position. So I'd like to make four main points today. I'm going to just give you the four points, and then I'm going to kind of uh, illustrate them. The first point I want to make is that freedom of religion and separation of church and state are elusive, perhaps impossible ideals, dating back to the founding of the nation. The second point I want to make today is that in modern times, from a progressive point of view like my own, the line between religion and politics has been blurred in sometimes terrifying ways, in ways that literally feel at times like matters of life and death. The third point I want to make is that historically, the blurring of lines of distinction between religion and politics has not been simply a conservative affair. Progressives and people of every political stripe have done it too. And we must all acknowledge that our history is rich with all sorts of people blurring those lines of distinction. And then the fourth point I want to make is that moving forward in the interest of a diverse democracy, we should not seek to separate religion and politics. It's perhaps the most provocative point. Or compartmentalize them in some artificial way. But to acknowledge and embrace their contested relationship. To engage this conflict to wage and hopefully win this culture war, rather than withdraw from it. And I want to mention the irony of a war metaphor, coming from someone like me, whose pacifism stems in large part from my faith. 
So the first point is that freedom of religion and the separation of church and state are an elusive, perhaps impossible ideal. One of the great founding ideals of America, the United States, is the freedom of religion. It's right there in the First Amendment. I always call it the very First Amendment, just to put an emphasis on how important it is. And among all of the different rights, it articulates five essential rights, which I believe actually are rights that have animated and enabled the great social movements of our history to transform the nation. The First Amendment reads, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government to redress, to, for redress of grievances. The right of freedom of religion, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, and freedom of petition are the core rights of citizenship that are enshrined in that very first amendment of the Constitution. And it's a reason, there's a reason why it's the very first. These are cherished rights which we all must embrace and protect. Thomas Jefferson, as I said, also articulated this famously in his 1785 Act for Establishing Religious Freedom. He made a point very forcefully about the separation of church and state. No church should rule over the government of the people. Uh, there's a long history of why he believed this and why the founding fathers and others uh, believed this uh, at the birth of the nation. But part of it was Jefferson's own deism, which was a kind of, as one of my colleagues, fellow religion once called it a watered down version of anything real, really religious. Uh, but I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that, that characterization, but deism is, is a, a less specific notion of a higher power. Uh, and, and Jefferson was someone who was skeptical about a particular kind of God, a particular kind of religious order. Uh, but there's also a long history in this uh, ideal being rooted in the histories of the tense and, and often violent histories between Catholicism and Protestantism, which had a great bearing on the founding of the nation uh, as well. That said, religion is also embodied in the nation's founding in other ways. When people talk about natural rights, when the founding fathers and others talked about natural rights, famously articulated in the Declaration of Independence, another product of Jefferson's hand and mind, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Interestingly, Jefferson revised John Locke's original conception of natural rights, which was life, liberty, and property. Jefferson gave it a kind of fancy flourish and said, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, thereby giving, in my reading of it, a kind of aspirational ideal to American political culture that we're all trying to kind of pursue happiness. I had a fascinating conversation with one of my students from China the other day, and she wanted to know why Americans are so much more happy than Chinese uh, folks. This is her uh, assessment. She's actually giving a speech about this today in my class. Uh, and I said, I'm not sure we're more happy. I just think we think we're going to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but our talk of natural rights, of the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as essential natural rights, are rights that stem from the God of nature and nature's God, as Jefferson also articulated in the Declaration of Independence. So right there, next to those natural rights, you have the God of nature and nature's God articulated. And it's important that the founders rejected uh, the role of church in governing political affairs. Much of this had to do with the immediate context of rejecting the notion of a divine right of kings, of rejecting the monarchy of Britain as a kind of anti-colonial act of resistance. And the, the rejection of the monarchy was not just a rejection of a political system where a king ruled over the people. It was also a rejection of a particular kind of religious ethos or religious belief that God gave the king the right to rule over the people. So in the rejection of the monarchy in the American Revolution, there was at once a rejection of a political system and the rejection of a religious belief or religious philosophy. And I think it's really important uh, to understand that. So very there, right in the founding documents of the nation, you have an illustration of the fact that the founding fathers, as, as, as skeptical of churches and religions and specific kinds of faith as many of them were, they were not fully able, nor did they want to, purge the nation, uh, nation's politics or political system of religion. 
that both are there embedded and in tension with one another in all of the founding documents that we constantly go back to. And when we talk about originalism, of going back to the founding fathers and, and trying to act the way they wanted to act, and I do not believe that we should always do that, because after all, Jefferson, in all of his attempt to compartmentalize things, was able to compartmentalize his love of freedom and equality, which is with his reliance on slavery. Indeed, the very rights of our government the, the, the idea that governments should be instituted to protect and preserve certain rights, what we then called natural rights, came from God. Natural rights were rights given to us by a creator that pre-existed any form of government. And that governments were constituted to protect and preserve the natural rights that God gave to all human beings. That was the initial sort of concept and bargain that the founding fathers were trying to work out. Today, we're more likely to think of civil rights and human rights as secular kinds of rights, coming from laws and legislation, from treaties and covenants. Uh, but when you, you can trace a long line of rights talk back from our modern, more secular conceptions of civil rights and human rights, which I don't think are devoid of any kind of religious or spiritual essence, uh, but you, if we think about them only as secular notions, we can trace a long line back to these conceptions of natural rights that came from God, that government was meant to protect. So right there you have, I think, this kind of fusion of religion and politics that I think we must acknowledge if we're going to be talking about civil rights and human rights in the 20th century. I'm a historian, so I take the long view on this. I don't think that there are breaks with the past. I think all of us is here because history weighs down on us, and history offers us opportunities and lessons that we should definitely heed and take up on. Other examples of the way that religion and politics is sort of fused together in our culture, I mentioned God Bless America. This is something that has become a constant sort of trope in presidential rhetoric, political rhetoric as well, but presidential rhetoric in particular. In fact, President Obama, early on in his term, uh, didn't say God Bless America after a speech. I forget which speech it was, but there was a speech very early on when he became president where he did not say God Bless America after the speech, and the, the right seized on that as evidence that he was, in fact, a Muslim <laughs> socialist. Uh, so God Bless America has become a rhetorical trope that is absolutely, it's a requirement for presidential speeches, particularly very important ones. Another example of sort of challenges between religion and politics is the establishment of the black church. The African American church, which was established in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, was a way for black people to remove themselves from white Christian churches that had rejected them from membership. And it's, I, I think we need to acknowledge that not only were those white Christian churches rejecting African Americans, preventing them from worshiping at all or worshiping in an equal way in those churches, but that was also, it also mirrored the way that the members of those white Christian churches were discriminating and subordinate against and subordinating African Americans in the political culture, denying them other kinds of rights of citizenship. So the people who were worshiping, the white people who were worshiping in those churches were the same white people who were discriminating against black people, both in church and in citizenship. And that's important, I think, too, to, 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 to understand. Uh, many African Americans, both slave and free, embraced Christianity explicitly, powerfully, as a way to assert their citizenship. Phyllis Wheatley, "'Twas mercy that brought me from a pagan land." Then she became a Christian. She converted to Christianity, and through her poetry, and through the articulation of her Christian conversion, she was making demands of citizenship on the political structure of the country and on the churches that didn't think that she was an equal human being in the eyes of God. And this was a pervasive claim and a pervasive rhetorical dimension of much of the writing of early black abolitionists uh, and slave narratives and so forth who embraced Christianity as a way to assert citizenship. So Christianity, a religious identity, was a, in many ways a vessel or a channel or a mode of asserting a particular kind of political identity. The relationship between immigration and religion is also, I think, very important in this country in terms of understanding how fused religion and politics is. There have been so many groups of immigrants throughout history. My own Irish Catholic people, my mother's people, the Italian 
uh, Jews from, uh, from Europe, uh, atheists and socialists of all kinds, who many of whom came in the late part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, and it was their political radicalism and their unwillingness or rejection of a particular kind of God, their explicit atheism that othered them, that created the perception that they didn't have God and were from another place and therefore should not be citizens, and their political radicalism only confirmed that. Uh, it's something that we see, I think, again in, in a lot of the anxiety about Obama's otherness. You see a kind of resurrection of this idea that he's radical, he's other, he's not a Christian, uh, as a way to cast him as a kind of outsider. Uh, even Muslims and Mormons, of course, in our own time, uh, have been subjected to this kind of prejudice. Uh, there was a Pew poll that was taken, very interesting Pew poll that was taken at the, in the height of the last election season, and it listed a whole bunch of identities and it asked people to say, which one of these identities would make you more likely or less likely to vote for this kind of person as president? And the three least important or least uh, prohibitive identities were black, woman, and Catholic. If you think about like where we were in 1960, right, where John F. Kennedy had to give a speech to, to, to you know, convince the country that the Pope wasn't going to run the White House. Right? The fact that women and black people were absolutely subordinate, were just beginning to mobilize great social movements that would transform the country to make it possible for Hillary Rodham Clinton and Barack Hussein Obama to contend for the Democratic nomination for president. But the three most prohibitive identities on that list were Muslim, Mormon, and atheist. And I don't think in my lifetime we will ever see an atheist president of the United States which in many quarters still sees itself as a Christian or Judeo-Christian nation. And so the punchline to what I'm talking about here is that religion and politics are not separate and have never been separate, and that indeed religion has been a way to police the kinds of people that are actually allowed to come into the political nation and be full citizens in the political body. The second thing I'd like to talk about today is the way that the, the sort of merging of politics and religion, uh, while always there historically, um, has become quite terrifying to a lot of people on the political left uh, in recent times. Um, there, uh, we, we all know, we're all familiar with the rise of the Christian conservative movement in the United States, which began in its sort of early formations in the 1960s and then kind of exploded on the scene in the 1970s and then fully came into kind of political power in the 1980s. Uh, down to our present time, the Christian conservative movement is still very, very powerful and very influential uh, in this country. One of the great geniuses, of, well, Mark's a genius of Ronald Reagan politically, was that he was not a particularly religious person himself, and yet he created a kind of coalition between fiscal conservatives and military interventionists, war hawks, and, uh, and religious conservatives that became the Reagan coalition, which was in existence, I would argue, and still in some ways, I think it's fallen apart now, uh, but it was really the uh, coalition that had an enormous amount of political power uh, for a generation in this country and had a huge uh, influence on our political world. But the growth and influence of groups like the Moral Majority, the Christian Coalition, more recently Focus on the Family, uh, cannot be denied and has to be acknowledged as a potent political force in our culture. These were religious organizations driven by religious beliefs, but they were conservative beliefs, but they were conservative political formations as well, and they were explicit about the fusion of those two things. This election season, for people like me, saw some exciting but also terrifying developments. The war on women, I don't call it the so-called war on women, I call it the war on women, um, with its hostility to abortion rights attempts at the state level principally, where the real assaults at abortion are taking place, United States at the state level, not at the, at the national level principally, although there are certainly problems there too. Um, this idea, that, that, that idea of, of uh, Sandra Fluke and the kind of slut shaming, uh, the attacks on kind of access to contraception, on women's reproductive health more broadly, uh, is something that in many ways is fueled by a kind of religious conservatism that seeks to police the bodies of women and the choices of female citizens. Uh, as a way to protect a certain kind of traditional way of ordering gender, of uh, relations between the sex, of policing sex itself and sexuality. Um, the opposition to marriage equality, you see fierce opposition to marriage equality and to LGBT rights generally. Uh, anytime a family or a child is concerned, whether I want to adopt a kid or get married to my partner or have health benefits that might allow us to engage in family planning, those are the principal issues. It's not don't ask, don't tell. It's not bullying necessarily. 
although I would say that homophobia is the worst form of bullying, um, and that, that homosexuals are not a harm to children, homophobia is. Uh, but the, the way that the conservative Christian right, and many conservatives who are not necessarily Christian, sort of go at those dimensions of the LGBT, those demands of the LGBT movement, is another thing that, frankly, from my perspective, as someone who is married, who is contemplating starting and having a family, who would like to raise children, and who was adopted myself by amazing parents who were straight and didn't turn me gay. I did that all on my own. <laughs> the idea that these policies would, would really be the targets of such unbelievable kind of ire that is driven by conservative Christian ideology is, I will say, quite terrifying. And it does seem to me, uh, at least in my interpretation of it, my perception, to be uh, often matters of life and death, what kind of family I can and should uh, be able to have. Even within conservative ranks, Mitt Romney's Mormonism became a huge problem during the political campaign for the Christian evangelical base. That Christian conservatives were very skeptical of Mormonism, many of them openly and explicitly called it a cult. Mitt Romney never talked about his Mormonism, very rarely talked about it. One of the problems with the Romney campaign, I think, was that he was never able, I've said this to my students in class, he was never able to art fully articulate his value system. He was never able to say, my values come from my faith, my values and how I work them out and articulate them and practice them are in my church. Because every time he talked about his Mormonism and his church work, it raised all sorts of questions about what this thing called Mormonism was. And of course, Mormons have experienced enormous kinds of discrimination throughout American history uh, on the level of many other disfranchised and dispossessed groups. One of the things that I rejected during the time, very, very vocally and very angrily, was calls on the left to kind of scapegoat or to denigrate his Mormonism and his religion. Because I was, a, I was on the Obama campaign as an advisor in 2008, and I saw what that did. I saw the pain and the suffering and the hurt and the damage that certain claims about someone's religion as being other, as being less than, as being a cult, etc., did to our public discourse and to a political candidate and a political movement. And I refused to participate in that kind of thing simply because now it was on the other side. And I rejected and called out all of my liberal left friends who did that. Um, so we have lots of examples of how religion conservative interpretations of Christianity in particular have sought to sort of uh, uh, aggressively defy or to resist certain kinds of rights claims by different kinds of groups. Uh, this also creeps into our debates about climate change, about evolution, about health care uh, provisions, and also health care exemptions for uh, religiously based uh, hospitals and organizations. Anne Pellegrini gave a great talk last night on religious liberty versus sexual freedom, question mark, in which she gave the statistic that one in five hospital beds in America are in Catholic hospitals, which receive a, a religious exemption under the Affordable Care Act that was written into the Affordable Care Act to exempt Catholic hospitals from having to afford uh, to grant access to contraception and other forms of reproductive health, certainly abortion, uh, to women who would like that. And when we think about one in five hospital beds in America being Catholic hospitals, that's a lot of women, a lot of families, and a lot of patients uh, that are subjected to that. And so we have a lot of these developments, which for some of us, those of us who are progressive, are a little terrifying, I will admit. And so for, you know, for progressives, um, you know, many, we see, we see this and we say, these political positions are motivated by religion, that there's a religious motivation explicitly that's driving these kinds of conservative uh, political positions. And religion is often used in these ways, according to this position, um, to fight against the civil rights of various groups, particularly women and LGBT people. Um, and so what we end up having to do, I, I would argue, on the progressive side of the political spectrum, is so often we need to reject religion because religion gets framed as simply that, as a way to fuel and drive conservative anti-civil rights kinds of agendas and policy. And so we choose rights over religion. And I would argue that that's a false choice. Because it goes the other way as well. Religious conservatives, many of them, which is a very diverse group of people, which includes a lot of African Americans, a lot of Latinos, a lot of immigrants, a lot of people in my family. People who are religious conservatives look at what we want, look at the kinds of lives that we would like to lead, look at the kinds of demands that we make, and are equally terrified. They perceive the secularization of America, which is where they have lumped much of that together, as being a threat to America. And so you have these really interesting sort of culture wars that develop where the progressives choose rights over religion, 
and the, the, and, the, and, the, and the religious folks look at us and see everything we do as a kind of secular assault on a Judeo-Christian traditional America. And so a new opposition emerges in our political culture. And it's a falsely constructed one, but one that's perpetuated by all of us in many ways, and myself included. Where we have religious conservative Republicans on one side, and we have secular liberal Democrats on the other side. And these are positions. And then politics, politics becomes the playground for this culture war. Politics and policy becomes the place where these two groups of these two oppositional groups end up having it out, which is another reason why religion and politics can never be fully dis, uh, uh, disentangled. But I want to say that there is, of course, as I've mapped out, a conservative religious kind of tradition in this country that has grown in number and in influence over the course of the last generation. It's always been there in the culture, dating back to the 18th and 19th centuries. But it's been there and it's been amplified and I think uh, much more aggressive in, in our own time, certainly in my lifetime. But I also want to say that this false distinction between kind of religious conservatives and secular progressives uh, is, as I said, a false distinction. There is as long-standing a history of religious progressivism in this country that defies and challenges and renders false, in my opinion, these neat dichotomies and binaries that often structure our discourse, our policies, and our culture. There are tons and tons of examples. I already gave you one about African Americans who embraced and asserted their Christianity as a way to demand full citizenship. The abolitionist movement itself was fueled by a deep and profound belief in Judeo-Christian principles all over abolitionist literature. I wrote my, first, my dissertation, my second book on the abolitionist movement. Um, one of the things I did in graduate school, I was at Columbia in graduate school, and I was studying with a bunch of radical Marxists who were also atheists, and, uh, and I except for Juan, who was an African-American guy who had grown up in the church, so he kind of got me a little bit. Uh, actually, I had a Mormon advisor, too, who would always sit me down, how are you doing today? And I always knew, he's like, have you been to church recently? Um, so I was raised by two, I was raised, I was raised as an intellectual, as an academic, by four advisors, two of them atheist, Marxist, radical, uh, one a Mormon who was deeply concerned for my soul, and an African-American Christian guy who was also a Marxist, radical, but he believed in God. Uh, so, so you can imagine how friggin' confused I was. <laughs> But when I began work on the abolitionist movement, I uh, got a copy of the King James Bible, and I would go to the library every morning, and I would read the Bible. And all of my colleagues in graduate school and the PhD program thought I was freaking nuts. They thought I was, I'd lost my mind that I was reading the Bible. And what I said to them was, you can't understand the abolitionists until you read the Bible. And I had read the Bible, thanks to the nuns and the priests and my parents and grandparents. I had read the Bible, but I had forgotten it. Right? You know, I, I was the, always the guy who asked all the troubling questions in CCD class. I was always the one like, if Mary was a virgin, um, I, was, I was that guy. Uh, I was that guy. You know, and then as I got older, I was like, I want to learn how to, to, to turn water into wine. Uh, it was a great party trick in college. Um, but, uh, but more seriously, the, when, to understand the abolitionists, you needed to know the Bible. And to understand the 19th century, you needed to know the Bible. The best-selling book in the 19th century at any given time, if you had had a New York Times bestseller list in the 19th century in any newspaper, it would have been, the Bible would have been the first thing on the bestseller list. The 19th century was dripping in religious sentiment and religious rhetoric and religious beliefs, etc. And all of the reform movements of the antebellum period, or the pre-Civil War period, whether you're talking about religion or suffrage, or you're talking about the Sabbatarian movement, which sought to make the Sabbath a holy day where people wouldn't work, all of these things were bristling and brimming with religious sentiment and religious inspiration. In fact, the Second Great Awakening, which was an evangelical uprising and outpouring in the early part of the 19th century, was one of the things that fueled those reform movements. And out of that movement came a notion among reformers, radical reformers and more conservative reformers, that every individual person, because they have God in them, has an opportunity and should, in fact, seek to reform society in the image of God, to create heaven on earth. It was a concept called the perfectibility of man, yeah. and extended to women as well. Uh, not always in rhetoric, not always in rhetorically, but in reality, it did. That there was a perfectibility of human beings, that we could perfect ourselves, and that we, by doing that process, by purging ourselves of sin, could actually create heaven on earth. And for the abolitionists, that meant a, 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 an earth where black people and white people were equal, where slavery, the sin of slavery, was, uh, was finally purged from the body politic. Early 20th century reformers. Uh, people who did work, really important work on children's rights and immigrants' rights and labor laws uh, were inspired in part by religious conviction, by deep religious faith. 
uh, the, the black freedom struggle, there's no greater example in the United States, and perhaps other than the abolitionist movement, of a profound transformational social movement that was driven by religious beliefs. The letter from Birmingham jail uh, is in many ways, uh, you know, Martin Luther King's tribute to, uh, to St. Paul and to Thomas Aquinas and other religious thinkers, Gandhi, uh, who were deep in, in inspirations to him. And in that letter, he creates a concept of just and unjust law that is embedded deeply, profoundly, irrevocably in Judeo-Christian principles. And he calls on other people of faith to ask them to join the struggle for black freedom and equality. He's particularly upset, not with the right-wing conservative Christians, not with the racist segregationists. He's upset with the white Christian liberals. The letter to Birmingham jail is written to eight white liberal Christian ministers and a Jewish rabbi because he's disappointed in them because they're standing idly by, silent, in the wake of this injustice. The black freedom struggle has always been, from the time the first slaves arrived in Virginia in 1619, black freedom struggle has always had a powerful religious engine to it. It's not the only engine. It's firing on eight cylinders. It always has. It always will. Thank God for black folks. Uh, but it is a movement that has been powered in part by that deep religious faith. There are other examples, the anti-war movement, the Catholic worker movement, the priests and nuns and others who would burn draft cards during the Vietnam era who have marched against these more recent wars, the nuns on the bus. Yeah. These are all progressive religious folks who have driven the radical tradition in this country. It's not to say all radicals are religious people, but to ignore the fact that religion in various forms, with various interpretations, has not powered a politics of protest, is to miss the best part of the history of the United States. <laughs> and so there are and always have been progressives, religious progressives and secular conservatives. Uh, progressives should not cede the ground to conservatives on religion or politics. And that's one of the big takeaways, is that we should never cede that ground. I just want to mention uh, one other, uh, two other points. One is that Peter Gomes, um, before he passed away, wrote an amazing, a, a great book called The Good Book, which is a book that tries to make the Bible accessible to a more modern audience. And it's, uh, he was famous for his sermons, but he also is a brilliant writer and uh, theologian. And one of the things that he does in that book, and he himself was a black, gay, Christian Republican who gave the benediction at Ronald Reagan's inaugural. Uh, and he was a lifelong member of the Republican Party until 2008 when he voted for Barack Obama just before his death. And he, had, uh, he said he had gotten, he had convened with God and gotten over the con considerable consternation of moving from the Republican Party. To the, Party. <laughs> <laughs> the only way that Peter could. Uh, but Peter's book, The Good Book, seeks to make, to open up interpretations of the Bible to understand how the Bible itself has been a political weapon and continues to be and tries to give us interpretations that will allow fuller, richer, more egalitarian, more inclusive vision of what Christianity teaches us about how we should live our lives. Um, and one of the things that I was struck by when I attended the National Equality March in 2009 in Washington, D.C., uh, was uh, how many religious people were there, how many faith groups were there, the Quakers were there, the UUs were there, so many different Christian denominations, Reformed rabbis, all sorts of folks, even some very progressive imams, African-American ministers, there were people of all different faiths uh, and stripes who were there in that march. And I remember thinking, my God, this is a very different, this is not Harvey Milk's Gay Rights March. This is a very different kind of gay rights march. And I, I took that as a sign uh, in many ways of progress. My own Catholic church uh, is experiencing an enormous sort of debate about politics and religion right now. I mentioned the nuns on the bus. There's a huge debate and conflict right now going on for the soul of American Catholicism in particular, uh, where the nuns and the priests are in many ways opposed to one another for a variety of reasons that have to do very centrally with gender and sexuality, um, that lay people in the hierarchy of the church are struggling to try to figure out what the meaning of Catholicism is in our own times. And there's a recent poll of American Catholics. American Catholics, church-going Catholics, are actually the third most progressive religious group in America on issues of LGBT rights, uh, second only to the, kind of the UU, the very liberal kind of conservative denominations, the UUs, etc., uh, and Reform Judaism. That American Catholics, as a whole, not all of them, obviously, have more progressive views on issues of contraception, <coughs> even abortion, and also of gay marriage and LGBT rights and gay adoption. My own parents are studying this. 
my mother has stopped tithing to the Catholic Church, and she now gives her tithes to Planned Parenthood. <laughs> my mother is also pro-life. She is pro-life, and she always will be deeply pro-life. Um, but she is now giving her tithes to Planned Parenthood because of the war on women. And she'll be the first one. If you think that, that it's a so-called war on women, you need to go talk to my mom. <laughs> And then finally, uh, I want to just close by talking uh, just briefly about the, this fourth issue that I, I want to talk about, which is that sort of moving forward in the interest of democracy, we should not seek to compartmentalize or separate religion and politics. They've tried to make clear that has never been the case in America. And so I think rather than engage in all sorts of consternation, the ideological bickering, and all these things that actually don't help us, any of us, uh, we should embrace the fact that these things are always views, that they are twins, not enemies, that we may have very different interpretations of those religious faiths that we come from and that we draw from to make political arguments and to shape the way we act politically in our lives. Uh, but we should not run away from this. Too often, I see this at the Kennedy School too, we try to sort of separate out emotion and reason, right? That if we make emotional arguments, they're somehow less valuable than if we make very clear, rational, logical arguments. And that's a fallacy, another false distinction of binary that came to us from the Enlightenment, which was an age where reason was trying to challenge religion to establish a greater truth, a different kind of truth in our political and social worlds. And so I reject that as well, that I think we need to see how these things are interrelated to one another to understand how people are coming at these things with different interpretations of that fusion between politics uh, and religion. And that emotion is something that infuses both our moral lives and our political lives. That we certainly can make rational, reasonable arguments with evidence and science and so forth. But there's also a place, an important place, a central place for arguments that are based on emotion, morality, religion, faith, identity, and so forth. And so I, my takeaway point is that I think we need to wage the culture wars. We need to wage them. We don't need to run away from them, withdraw from them. And hell, I would rather fight the culture war than the war in Iraq or Afghanistan or anywhere else. I don't shy away from this because I'm implicated in it. I have been a foot soldier in these wars unwillingly and unwittingly for a long time. My very body, my life, my love, my family, my friends are implicated in this war. And sometimes when I hear people call for civility in public discourse, it's people who are on the sidelines watching what has happened to the people who are subjected to the incivility of those culture wars. And my thing is, look, these wars are raging. Let's join up. Get in. Get off the sidelines. Because civility, after all, is really a privileged position of luxury. But we are not implicated in these culture wars. And if you are, everyone I know is implicated in culture wars is not calling for civility. They're calling for a victory. <laughs> and so I say, let's have that. And let's figure out where we're coming from and get to know each other and figure out how we mobilize individually in conversations with people who are vastly different from us. The kinds of conversations I've had with those who come from religious positions that rejected me as a homosexual but now love me as a human being. I say that as someone who has waged the war in individual conversations, in tough conversations, in often very, very contested and uncivil conversations, but has come over to another place in those conversations to build a different kind of community. And I say that as someone who is engaged in the culture war as part of social movements, who has tried to organize social movements and mobilize social movements and mobilize resources for social movements and is proud to be part of social movements that have helped to change the world that we live in, not just the United States, but the world. And I'm proud of that work. If I died tomorrow, I would be happy that I stepped into those culture wars and fought them as hard as I could, even when I didn't like fighting them. But I liked winning them. <laughs> I want to end with an anecdote from um, Morning Prayers. Some of you uh, come to Morning Prayers a lot. Some of you come and have heard me speak there. Um, on election day, I gave Morning Prayers. Uh, which I was very happy to do. And there was a man who came up to me afterwards who was very upset with my lesson. And I concluded my lesson with this. I said, I was quoting, I was drawing from Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, where Jesus talks about uh, treat others and what would happen when the Lord returned to figure out what to do with all of us who had either risen up or failed that challenge. I said, the stakes this political season could not be higher. On the one hand, 
we have a party and a president, both imperfect for sure, who seem to understand that the nation is better off when everyone has opportunities to flourish, that government has a vital role to play in creating and sustaining these opportunities, and that compassion and fairness should be the principal standards by which we measure the success or failure of our democracy. In contrast, we have another party and another presidential candidate who have, time and again, shown themselves to be craven and callous, who pledge to shred our safety net and control our bodies, who reject the way we love and restrict our right to vote. Their plan is not only politically irresponsible, it is profoundly immoral. Jesus wouldn't like these Christians either. And I had quoted Gandhi earlier in my sermon. Gandhi says, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. That is so unlike your Christ. And I said, Jesus wouldn't like these Christians either. Frankly, he wouldn't even recognize them. I've thought a lot about that man's anger with me ever since, even though he agreed with me politically. And after a long period of reflection, I own my words and my values, the religious setting in which I uttered those words, and talked the talk. And the political action I took in the ballot booth to walk the walk immediately after I gave that lesson. He was mad at me because he said the right uses religion to fight politics. The left should never use religion to fight politics. But for me, as with so many others of us in this room and long and far outside of it, matters of democracy and matters of divinity are inextricably and inescapably bound. They always have been and they always will be. I often ask myself, often when I'm by myself, what would Jesus do? And I try to live according to my answers to this question. But I am neither pious nor perfect in this respect, far from it. After all, as you can well guess, I am not Jesus. <laughs> I am just a gay American who wants to change the world. I'm talking about kind of the way that Martin Luther King understood that kind of project, right? in the way that 
Frederick Douglass understood that project, the way that Dorothy Day understood that project, the way that a lot of people understood that project, of a different kind of war, not one that's filled with hate, but one that's filled with ideas, one that's filled with love, one that's filled with a certain kind of empathy, even for people that you vehemently and vigorously disagree with. That said, that's an idealistic vision of what you can do as part of this larger kind of cultural context. Um, and so there are groups of people, particularly, I think, Muslims in this day and age, in a post-9-11 world, always African-Americans in this country, and particularly African-American men in power, um, I think have a, an African-American women in power have to contend with the fact that any time they raise their, the volume of their voice, any time they dress in a particular kind of way, any time they play a particular kind of music or say a particular kind of thing, um, they're going to be perceived immediately as being angry, violent, full of rage, because that's the perception of those groups historically and contemporarily um, that is just below the surface of even the most civil kinds of discourse, right? But I really, I really believe that we gain more from pricking the sort of surface of the civil discourse and letting that stuff come to the fore. Um, and some of us will, will fight the battles more vigorously than others because, like, for instance, my husband, who's African American, does not fight these wars the way I fight these wars. Right? He's not as outspoken about, he would not have gotten up and given this speech, but the work he does in the world, usually more collaboratively with people who disagree with him, usually much more on an individual level than in a big public forum like this, because um, he's very alert to the kinds of things that Barack Obama is constrained by. Right? This idea that he can't. Uh, and it's interesting, when we're, as we've got married, all, all couples fight. Uh, we fight very differently. And, and I, I fight like a working class Irish Catholic kid. He fights like an African-American man who's weary from fights and hasn't fight those battles his whole life and also doesn't want to be seen as, as too aggressive. He's much more of a peacemaker when we fight than I am. And it's part of our different temperaments. And so I understand it. I live with it. Um, but I, so maybe, maybe reclaiming the language of the culture war maybe isn't the right way to do it. Maybe it needs a reframing and so that we have to figure out how to fight in different ways such that we can... Um, we can use whatever privilege we have if we're not part of groups that have those perceptions foisted on us, that we you know, take the lead in certain contexts, in certain you know, realms, uh, whereas other parts of the battle are done in different ways by different people in different contexts. But I take your point that it's that different groups are perceived differently, and the language of war, which then associates with the language of aggression, violence, of rage, etc., is not something that every group of people can do equally. I, I, I accept that. So if you can come up with a reframing for the culture war, I'm happy to love you. Happy to hear. Yeah. Well, speaking of the language of war, I don't understand the statement that you'd rather be fighting the cultural wars than the war in Iraq. The war in Iraq killed hundreds of thousands of people. So the war in Afghanistan and in Palestine and many other places. Mm -hmm. Americans are so self-absorbed in the so-called cultural wars that they only think of their own selfish selves. And uh, they pretty much uh, distance themselves from foreign policies that are literally killing hundreds of even millions of people. And now when you have a black president or a female secretary of state, somehow that makes it politically correct. I mean, we have to look at this not in our own uh, context, but in the context of the larger world. And we're simply not doing that. And the cultural wars are distractions from that. So still the war in Afghanistan is far more important than that, not to belittle these other issues. But look, we, we've lost the sense of uh, a world citizen. Okay, um, I appreciate the comment, and I, I have a couple of things to say to that. One is that I think, um, uh, first of all, I don't agree with the premise that, that, that one thing is, is more important than the other. I think they're related. Uh, I don't think that these things are distractions, because these things impact millions and millions and millions of people's lives, not only here, but elsewhere. Uh, and much of what's happening in the culture wars here have an impact on what's going on elsewhere. For instance, the fact that we are winning, in my opinion, the culture war on LGBT rights has a direct impact on the lives of Ugandans and people in Malawi and Nigeria and all across the world who are having bills introduced into their parliaments and legislatures by evangelical Christians here who understand that they're losing the war here, who are going over there to establish churches, convert people, and then influence the political process. So, uh, so to, to not make that connection, if, you're, if we don't want to fight the culture war on LGBT rights because we're talking about Afghanistan, we miss Uganda. And so, and I'm someone who does make that connection. So you're, we, we you're, miss Uganda, we miss Rwanda, we miss Burundi. It didn't I, I understand that. Good. There are massacres, genocide right. committed there. I mean, your LGBT didn't do a thing about that. Okay. Well, first of all, you don't know who you're talking to because I was actively involved as a student in the anti-apartheid movement when I came to college, uh, and that was the first thing I did when I came to college. Uh, 
I spoke out against 9-11 the day after 9-11, was blacklisted, got death threats, my apartment was broken into, I was blacklisted by Lynn Cheney, all sorts of anthrax scares, all that stuff. I was in the front lines from the day after 9-11, protesting all of these wars, and I still do, and I can send you clips to dozens of articles I've written for the nation and everywhere else, pro to videos of speeches I've given, protest marches I've gone to, pictures, I'll give you anything. So I make no apologies for where I stand on those foreign policy issues, because when I mention a lot of people being silent, I'm not one of them. And when I die tomorrow, that's the thing I'll be proudest of, is that I was right on September 11, 2001, but most people were silent. That said, you have to make a connection between these things. I think you're right. To only talk about this, and I am, and I'll send you some articles I've written critiquing the LGBT community and the marriage equality movement because they're navel gazing. They're not making the connections analytically, structurally, politically, ideologically that need to be made between these various things. So I connect the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which I spoke out against, both the in favor of repeal and also in favor of the celebrations of repeal as a victory as a way to get LGBT people into the military to fight these wars that are unjust. And the LGBT community was largely silent on issues of foreign policy while they were attempting in their own way to uh, uh, enact the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So I've been critical from all sides of that. So I, I, I think your criticism is right, but if you're directing your criticism at me, I'm not, you're it's the wrong not a person. personal matter. Yeah. It's, it's a social matter and, and it's okay. not just a political matter. And no, I, I, I agree with that point. So because you're, 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 that statement that you made, maybe I confused it. So okay. I, I, I totally agree with you that we need to make these analytical connections between these various mm -hmm. systems of injustice and structural forms of inequality. But to say that we need to not be fighting the cultural war on LGBT issues because we should be opposing the war in Afghanistan. There are many of us who are doing both. And those of us who are doing both and making those linkages, I think, need to be heard in the public sphere even more than, than, than they are. No question. Yeah. Yes, and speaking to that, what I heard you say when you said you'd rather be fighting the cultural war than fighting in Afghanistan, I read oh, yeah. that. <laughs> I read that as the point is that these are cultural conflicts, whether they are here or in Afghanistan or whether they're with the United States or in another country. And I, I think you brought out the issue of conflict that live at every level of life in a very uh, cohesive way. And what I would ask, and I'm sorry that this gentleman had to leave, but what I would ask is, how do you see us coming together with your style, your roommate style, with this gentleman who's yeah. sitting over here, with this gentleman who's saying, how do we get that discourse mm -hmm. and not be thinking of it as a fight or, mm -hmm. but as a negotiation to work forward for world peace? Okay. From the dining room table. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's where. Yeah. And, it moved, and, and it we have forward. to include our Conservative and liberal friends around our dining room table, and we have to, since we're on the, on the liberal side, we have to make sure that our liberal friends don't shut down our smaller yeah. number of yeah. conservatives. Yeah. No, no, no question. But when I used to talk about I'd rather be fighting the cultural war here than fighting the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, that, I, I want to be very clear, was not that I don't care about Iraq and Afghanistan. I want an end to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I have wanted those ends since the, before they began. And so that's, that, was my, that was my point in saying that. That, if that was interpreted any other way than me being absolutely opposed to these unjust wars that George W. Bush has waged and that Barack Obama has, in some ways, continued, uh, in many ways continued, uh, including the ramping up of drone attacks, which I think are just absolutely egregious, um, and, and, and so forth, uh, and America's policy in Israel and Palestine. I was in Israel and Palestine last year, and that was a traumatic and terrifying experience, and making linkages between these things is hard to do, but something that I think many of us who were there were working on. Um, so that wasn't what I was saying at all, is that we shouldn't care about anywhere else in the world because we have to fight for gay marriage here. That is not the takeaway point that I want people to have. Um, that said, you know, I do think, to your other point, you know, I don't feel like in the public sphere, right, in truth spheres like this and, you know, uh, writings and those kinds of things, I'm pretty fierce, right? as you can see. I, like, lay it out there. Um, but as my students will, will attest to, I think, and my friends and my opponents, ideologically, religiously, and otherwise, will attest to, like, I love sitting down over a meal. I love breaking bread, right, and having a drink. 
and having these conversations and getting after it and trying to figure out where we are. That's how I've been able to retain many of my friends who are on the opposite side of where I am in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I have one of my best friends, who I was, for whom I was the best man, is a Tea Party Zionist. He was in my wedding, right? And he and I had, I mean, <laughs> so be a fly on the wall in those debates, and those, and where like literally our spouses have called each other, worried that we're gonna, you know, he'd fight to take a bullet from me. He he would push my husband out of the way to take a bullet from me, so you know, and has proven himself to be that way over and over and over again. And me too. We disagree profoundly over this. But you know what I've done? I've gotten him to stop writing Palestinians in quotation marks on Facebook. Small victory, small victory, right? Small victory. I'm like, those quotation marks are a sign of dehumanization of an entire group of people. And as a Jew, you should be able to understand at least that. And he stopped. And our friends have noticed. Doesn't mean he and I are going to see face to face, eye to eye, on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But those kinds of conversations over a meal, over a drink, in these kinds of in more private, intimate settings, do do political work. Right? Those kinds of personal relationships are political in that way. Right? Feminist movement taught us that a long time ago. And that's really important. And I tell, like to tell my students whenever I teach social movements that the, the social movement is the movement and the, the social is as important as the movement. Right? And I don't think that we need to engage in a kind of false civility, which I think my, one of my students back there, Chris Lummer, gave a great speech on this the other day. He said, if I had a nickel for every time someone in the Kennedy School class heard something that someone said, and the response was, I'd like to push back on that. <laughs> Rather than, I totally disagree with you. Right? And he gave a great speech about that. And he was coming from a Christian religious background. A religious, and he ended the speech by testifying to that. Right? And it was a great speech. And I, I wish more people would sort of hear that. Right? We don't need to agree. We don't always need to be civil. Because civil discourse in the public sphere often masks an enormous number of prejudices. I had an African-American roommate in college who grew up in the South. His parents grew up in the Deep South, and they remember drinking at Colored Water Fountain. So much so that when we moved into Quincy House our sophomore year, and Master Michael Schnagel came over and introduced himself as Master Schnagel to Mr. Campbell. Mr. Campbell shook his hand, and then he walked away, and he turned to Mr. Campbell turned to my father, Coach McCarthy, and said, no, my, no son of mine is called a white man master. Right? And he was, you know, and I remember Mike said to me when I was talking about, oh, the South is so racist. And he said, I would much rather live in Birmingham than Boston. Because in Birmingham, they call me the N-word to my face. In Boston, they invite me to a dinner party and then deny me a bank loan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my name is Chris O'Brien. I'm an undergrad at the college and um, the son of two women. Um, I often feel like I'm on the sidelines when I should be in, in the fight. Um, I, given my age, I grew up at a time where there weren't a lot of out uh, gay and lesbian couples with children. Yeah. Um, I spent my childhood telling my friends that my mom's best friend lived with us. Okay. And, um, but I also grew up in a family very accepting. I grew up in a UU family and um, often didn't have the opportunity to fight over the dinner table the way that I would like to. Yeah. Um, how do I get into the fight more? Uh, and and I don't want to feel like I'm on the sidelines, especially when I feel like I have a lot to offer the, the movement. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I, I thank you for that. Um, there's a great video of a guy named Zach Walls. Do you know? Have you seen this video? Mm -hmm. He's a young man from Iowa who is the son of two lesbian. Mother. Oh, yes, in I, yes, yes. And he's uh, just written a book. He addressed the, 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 Senate. the city council. Yeah, the city council. Right? And uh, it's a great video for those of you who haven't seen it. And he's this really eloquent guy. He's yeah. very tall, very good looking, very athletic, was an Eagle Scout, and he had all of that stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and he got up at the city council meeting and talked about his mothers and talked about his family and talked about his childhood. And he was speaking at a, at a place where they were, gonna, they were trying to do away with the marriage ruling uh, in, in Iowa, so this was a public forum where he did that. And then has become an activist himself, and became an activist because of that speech. And he was a college student who did it, much like yourself. So one of the ways- I was very I, jealous of that speech. Yeah. <laughs> so was I. Why did I make so that speech? Well, you can make that speech, you know? And that's my point, is that I think that one of the things that I think helps to fight the battles, whether we want to go to war or not, obviously it gets me in trouble. I won't think about the Ukraine, I will think about that. Um, the, the, 
is that we need to tell our stories to people. Like those stories can be weapons, right? Uh, and they can also be things that, that you know, the, the, um, they can also open up the possibility. I, I believe deeply that these kinds of storytelling strategies and social movements, my colleague and friend Marshall Gantz here at the Kennedy School teaches a course, uh, several courses on this where he talks about the value of storytelling as a strategic mode of political work. Um, and I think that telling your story is really powerful, right? To, to, to tell that story, particularly your story, what you get to do is your moms get to tell their story, but when they tell their story, there's already some skepticism about whether or not they're harming children, right? Because they're lesbians who are trying to raise kids, right? And all gay people have to deal with this. Gay men, I think, even more so in some ways than women because of sexist notions about women's inherent ability and capacity to be mothers. Uh, but whereas men are just these horrible creatures, I mean, gay men especially. Uh, and so the, the, the way that you can tell the story is to, as the kid who wasn't harmed, right? And so you get to speak back to that very violent discourse of harms children in a way that your mothers even can't quite do that. I'm sure they can, I'm sure they're wonderful. Now, they're quite clear they are. They've done a good job. But I think that's one way for you to do that. You don't need to be necessarily like marching out there at the front of the thing with the banner or yelling at somebody in a public space. You can just tell your story and anybody will listen, right? And and not and stop calling your, your your mom your mom's best friend, right? That's one that's one transformation that you've had, and you can incorporate that into the speech. I used to that that, that when you added that detail, that's a powerful detail. That I used to be constrained by whatever in a way that I would mischaracterize my other mom. And now I don't want to do that anymore. What you've just said to me is that you've had a, your own transformation, in part because the culture's changed a little bit, or you're in a place now where you're freer to say the things that are true. And so you need to be able to embed that in the story that you tell in a way that I think will help to change people's hearts and minds. Well, that's that's what's so interesting is I, I, I grew up in Amherst. I mean, I didn't, I didn't grow up in a, you know, I grew up in a, in a one of the most liberal places. Yeah. I can't even imagine what it must be like to grow yeah. up in, in, in Iowa. Iowa. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or Nairobi. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. For